start. So, hello everyone. Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to welcome all of you at uh, lecture of Thomas Rom. This lecture we're organizing uh, parallel to our studio, hardware and software and architecture in um, Technical University of Vienna. And uh, tonight we have a very, very unique guest. Thomas Rom is indeed a pioneer of circular construction. And uh, he was working in this field since his students' time, his, his time at uh, Technical University in Vienna. And um, even his diploma he dedicated to uh, recycle construction. Um, so he's developing uh, new strategies um, and uh, constantly tries to invite more and more parties, more and more participants in this circular process. And uh, what's important, he not only raises awareness of the uh, problems which we have in uh, construction industry, but also offers solutions and very practical solutions. And um, he's a founder of Bau Carousel. It's a very interesting enterprise, which solves not only ecological, but as well social problems. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he will tell much more interesting about all of these aspects. So I'm very honored to welcome tonight uh, Thomas Rome. So Thomas, the stage is yours. Uh, please uh, continue. Um, can I can I have the host to start the uh, the presentation? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah. So here we are. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you for your invitation, Artem. It's a real pleasure to be with you and to have uh, already visited our site at the uh, village in Dritten. I will talk about uh, circular architecture. It's going to be a title of uh, a, a conception of a book. It's not really a book. It's more an idea. Uh, but the title is ready, as you see. And um, I will uh, shortly, uh, shortly talk about um, our work of the last uh, decade, one can say. And um, our special theme for today, it's kind of a chapter in, within this book, uh, which is called Unside Resources. Um, yes, I'm, I'm Thomas Rom. I, um, as Artem has said, I, I did my um, architecture diploma on the, at the um, uh, Technical University in Vienna. And um, I have an uh, architectural practice, a civil technical bureau within the um, third district here in Vienna. We do research, um, um, we do planning, and we also do construction site, the management of a big construction site, as you can see here on this image. So um, resources on site. Um, the best resource you can ever have on site is a house. Yeah. And when you keep that house and you do something with it, you save up to 90%, 95% um, of all the CO2 emissions. And this is what we are interested in, in changing the game in having and searching new arguments for alternative uh, perspectives in architecture. And this is a project from Querkraft and we have a collaboration with Querkraft since um, a couple of years. And it's just a graphic novel actually uh, to explain what the effect is when you don't, when you do not simply erase or um, dis dismantle a building completely and build something new. But you try to go on and work on with the structure. So um, I'm, I really appreciate um, your approach, Artem. And uh, the studio um, is perfectly um, online with, with our ideas of, um, of proceeding in the closer future with architecture, at least the urban architecture. And uh, what you also see, I mean, it's not just a matter of CO2 emissions, um, but you have all this traffic and all these goods carrying around and, and, and um, uh, being transported um, instead of uh, um, be being um, part of an intelligent um, uh, concept or intelligent strategy. So, um, and the next uh, one is also a competition uh, with Queercraft in, in Germany where we choose to do the same, 
to keep um, at least the structural um, uh, the structural um, uh, existing uh, building and uh, to do the dismantling of the facades and, um, and partly of the building itself, but um, trying to carry on with a lightweight construction on top of it, as you can see here on the lower part, um, and, and, and creating a double of, uh, or actually doubling the surface of the existing building. And at the same time, um, reducing the CO2 emissions compared with the uh, complete um, a demolishing um, and uh, the new building of uh, about the same uh, size and, and in this perspective on the lower end you're saving 90 percent of all CO2 emissions and you're even faster so you have good arguments ecological arguments but also economy on the economy side of such a project and um, and, and this is another example in that case we we were not involved, but um, I think it's really representing what it's uh, what it should be like. Um, and uh, Queercraft uh, did succeed in finding a second use for the pavilion. They are about or they have already built um, uh, for this postponed uh, ex exhibition, and the Austrian pavilion in Dubai will be. Um, uh, transported and uh, re-erected and um, as, as far as I know as a part of the German school in, um, in the Vereinigte Emirate. And this has a long tradition actually because in, um, in 1958 uh, uh, the same thing happened to, to Karl Schwarzer's um, a pavilion in Brussels which is now um, uh, positioned in Vienna as the um, uh, at the Einuswanziger House, it's a uh, museum, it's a part of a museum. So in, in a way, um, we have forgotten uh, to, to follow this tradition of uh, keeping our values and our architecture with us. And, um, and this um, is what we're trying to remember also in the Atlas of uh, Recycling, a book which has been published in um, 2018 and the English version in 2019 followed. Uh, by the way, uh, powered by the city of Vienna also, because city of Vienna has a real in strategy to become a major player in circular economy, at least in construction. And this is our model. We are talking about on-site recycling. And that's not only recycling, because it's also reuse, as you um, have already seen. And, and it's, it's also on a, on a third level, and it means reduce. So uh, perhaps, uh, or you can also say refuse, if you want to. We're talking about the 10 Rs, starting with refuse and ending with recycling. But, um, uh, but let me just pick out this three, um, because reducing is a thing I'm going to explain to you on a strategic, on an urbanistic level. Yeah, you can plan um, and the mass flow of a, of a bigger destruct, um, of a bigger development area without uh, any doubt. You can plan this. You already know what's going to be um, uh, the excavation or the uh, needed concrete material and so on. And uh, in most cases in the urban areas, you have uh, already buildings standing on these brownfields mostly. And um, you, you will see um, there can be a lot of components being reduced or reused in, in the following process, which is the idle process at all. So no transportation is necessary when you reuse the same components in your project. And this is uh, what we call on-site uh, material management or on-site circular construction. And this is what this lecture is um, today about. So, um, and another competition with Querkraft um, a couple of years ago um, was at the Obere Donaustrasse, where um, um, actually a hotel was um, um, planned to be built. And um, this was the situation. And uh, actually, we found it uh, valuable and necessary to uh, recycle all the existing um, building components and um, try to um, uh, suggest a logistic flow um, and the processing um, and recycling uh, uh, of all these materials 
just um, to, to save it and to process it on site um, with an extent of 66,000 uh, uh, cube meters of different kinds of material and then um, build with that material and with an on-site mobile um, a concrete unit, uh, the whole hotel complex. And this uh, seemed to most people uh, to be impossible. But we have proven that for several times that this can um, not only uh, function and function well, but this can also be uh, more economic uh, also. So um, in a way, it has a, um, an approach like um, this artist, um, the Spanish artist Lara Alma Segui um, had uh, exposed this 10 years ago in the Secession here in Wien, and she only um, tried to um, um, expose the building itself by its material components. So what you see in the Secession is the Secession, but um, <laughs> just the components of the building materials. So this was um, a nice um, picture also for our work, yeah, in, in a way. You see this different kind of material, mostly mineral resources, uh, we do need for construction purposes. But um, we also have to move um, a couple of mounds of earth, um, doing the excavation work, uh, digging a hole and so on. And, um, and soon um, and, and very often we also have demolition and um, construction uh, materials or demolition construction waste uh, to be reused or recycled. So um, in this, um, we were trying um, at at, uh, before the pandemic, um, I had a, um, a public speech um, with a couple of hundred um, uh, people in the audience and uh, trying to um, sketch out what a standard for these procedures could be. And uh, this project with the agency, with the Environmental Agency of Austria and the Umbrella Organization of Recycling in Austria and me has set up was a standards for resource sound construction. And, um, and first of all, I, I will give you some figures at hand what the situation is. So in, um, in terms of statistics, um, construction um, is uh, responsible for 70% of all waste uh, per year. We have 60 million tons per, uh, per year of uh, waste materials in Austria. And you see 55% are excavation materials and almost 70% are construction demolition waste. So more than 70% of all this waste coming up all year is due to construction. And this 60 million tons on the output side, um, we have um, per year, is going along with um, 200 million tons on the input side, on the need side. And there also 70% or between 50 and 70%, depending on the economic growth, is used in construction. So this is the main part. This is um, really something uh, which counts, which is important. And out of this 200 million tons, 60% are mineral resources, which are getting short. Uh, especially not in the eastern part of, of Austria, but already in the western part, you can feel that, that sand and aggregates are becoming rare. Yeah. And that's the situation we are dealing with. And a circular construction is not just an idea, but it's a basic need to go on with our economy. And, and there is a, a massive disproportion between our waste and and uh, and um, our recycling rate side and uh, and the need side also. So um, and and we won't get things fixed by um, having more waste. Of course, <laughs> we uh, we need to reduce uh, the need of materials massively uh, within a short amount of time, and uh, and actually. Um, uh, and even closing the loops will just serve for one third of the needs of material and resources in Austria. And loops, uh, the loops are not closed at all. Absolutely not. This is what we have to do. You know, first, we have to close these loops, which um, 
which is really necessary for circular economy. But then secondly, we have to reduce our need side just by making things more durable. Yeah, to, so, so we really have to work with all the resources we have on site and all the existing resources we stockpiled uh, since a couple of decades in our urban areas. And a third and la last but not least, um, we have to use more renewable resources, not only in terms of energy, but also in terms of materials, of material resources. And all these uh, three points um, are equally necessary to go on with a, uh, a, a, to have some progress in this in this field of uh, resources. So, um, and the last word has um, Brigitte Kari from the um, Environmental Agency of Austria, and she's pointing out uh, recently that the circular material use rate in Europe on the average is 11.6% or 11.5% and 11.6% is the circular material use rate in Austria. So it's, it's hardly above 10%. Yeah, we are far away from, from 100% and not even 70%, uh, which should be um, the case uh, according to European law. So what we have to do is uh, actually what we have been trying to do for years. And let me start with the earth part, with the excavation part. And we go to, to Zurich and to, to Switzerland. Um, and this is the, um, the, the Technical University at, uh, at Zurich with an exhibition uh, about rethinking or think earth um, and using more excavated material as a building material. And um, uh, um, surely you know this uh, building um, of Hetzel de Meuron where they exposed uh, this uh, concrete um, uh, made out of uh, excavation material and uh, or the other case in, um, and in Laufen near, near to Basel where they used um, a kind of um, adobe um, uh, uh, prefab uh, part for the facade of this logistic um, uh, building. And uh, actually, um, a couple of months ago, um, I, I met these guys from the ETH Zurich, uh, we, uh, who are trying to, to do a kind of a earth um, uh, concrete. And, and um, this is um, what their presentation is saying that uh, no polluted earth could be used to 76% in Switzerland. So um, more than three thirds of all materials is actually excavated materials is actually usable for building purposes even. And this is what they're trying to do. Yeah? They, it's another kind of concrete they're developing. They're called Oxara. And it's really super interesting what they're trying to, to uh, bring up and uh, by reducing 90% of uh, CO2 emissions and also being less expensive with the materials. And we did something um, a parallel to this uh, a few years ago for the um, urban development area of the Wildgarten, which is owned by the or developed by the Austrian real estate development. Um, and in that case, um, we had a, a really a, 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 an undisturbed um, a soil here. Um, on this side, and um, we decided to to keep it uh, on the side and to work with it and to to make it fit for veg vegetation uh, substrates on on the um, on the building um, greenery. And we started just by analyzing the side, and you see our grid here, twenty by twenty meters. Um, uh, analysts um, um, were taken. And, uh, and this is the result. So you have all the qualities and the green ones you can use and the red ones you, you have to pay um, and to, to, um, to bring to the landfill. But you see the prevailing part were green and uh, the soil was actually usable. And um, we suggested um, to, to calculate this masses and to have a logistic concept of reusing this excavated soil as a material. And here you see the site, and not even one building um, is, 
is started and not on, not one construction site has started and all the soil already had to be moved away just in order to um, build the infrastructure on the site and this is why uh, we stockpiled it on the site and if we even did the calculation that we could rent a site apart the construction area um, and it was less expensive to pay the rent for this uh, surface for these plots of land than to uh, bring it to the landfill and depose it. So actually we did all these calculations for three building phases and uh, here we did even the calculation for the infrastructure with the building model and uh, we um, because of the um, small sized buildings we had a 40% um, more masses being excavated and uh, had to be stored but all these calculations uh, did finally end in a, a logistic plan using um, the neighborhood or the, uh, the, the site beside um, and the plot uh, beside to store and to uh, stockpile on um, uh, these air earthers to be um, built in again. And this is um, a photo where I'm standing on top of one of those fields and um, and the material is waiting to be um, re, um, reprocessed again. And it looks like this. Uh, so this was the hill where I'm standing. And this is the uh, processing of the material on site. So you have a crusher and you have a sieve. You're sieving the, the material. And then you have actually a building material. Yeah. And um, I wasn't sure, but I, I think it's no more. It, it's and in the meantime, it's necessary to talk even about the basics um, uh, with all you young architects. Uh, and so when you when you have a seeding line, you have a different size of um, of, uh, of of sand and gravel to be used, and you have the, these um, components which cannot be used for building purposes beyond this this line, this blue line, which is just too fine to be used as a building material, but they could still be used and uh, for vegetation substrates um, when they don't uh, exceed a certain amount of percentage. But this is how it works. Here you are sieving um, the, um, the excavation material and you get a sieving line and um, the red line is um, the material on site and the green line is marking the corridor for a standard conform use um, as a vegetation substrate. So this was uh, the process we've been uh, working on with the University of uh, Natural Science and Resources and, and you see in most cases there's just sand missing to bring the red line into the green corridor and this is what we did on the side. So we crushed the, the sand um, stone below and we mixed it with the upper soil and uh, ready it goes. Um, and we had an on site um, uh, concrete um, unit also, but not proceeding in that case, not proceeding the excavation material. What we um, did on another side, um, what, what I'm talking about now. And this actually is also this, uh, the process which we are describing in, um, in our recycling atlas. So I'm talking about Aspen now, which has been the former airport of Vienna before the Second World War. And, and then for a long time, there has been nothing on the side. And, and, and then within a period of 20 years, there was a huge development process. And it, well, now um, the Seestadt Aspen is one of the biggest uh, development areas in, in Europe. One can say that for 20,000 people and 20,000 um, jobs um, gonna be built there. And what you see here in front is the, the uh, plant of General Motors, actually a barrier for, for this um, area. Uh, but um, uh, on, on the back side here, on the, um, you see the, um, the um, U1 uh, coming directly on the side. And this is what we did. Actually, we used the gravel of this uh, little lake and the gravel of the excavation material. And we made a concept for, um, for the processing these, uh, of these materials and on-site processing. And, um, and we did the tendering also um, to find a, uh, 
uh, mobile uh, concrete unit uh, which was able to process all these materials and we ended up with uh, 1 million tons of locally processed materials and uh, partly uh, let's say half of it was proceeded to, uh, to be concrete on site and the other half was um, done uh, or was processed for landscape design. And here you have some, some images. Uh, we had about uh, 20 uh, developers on 25 um, uh, building sites and they were all involved in this process. And uh, what we did then is uh, to, to make a list um, all the white um, um, columns are uh, the materials which could be um, proceeded and um, could be gained or regained on site um, and all the all the rest you say it differs between 50 and here 15% uh, had to be transported to the site. So there's a really big, a huge potential of using on-site material for construction and especially for housing construction. And this is, was part of our work. We had this gravel, um, this, uh, this gravel uh, um, um, uh, a model and we just intersected with our, um, uh, with our lower floors and garages and, um, and the low part and, uh, of the buildings. And we had an exact um, uh, feature of the um, of the gravel, which could be used um, and processed as concrete, and then we um, measured um, the excavation sites to use uh, partly these materials in exchange for work, and um, and the street level was slowly lifted up, slightly lifted up, so we could use the material from the excavation directly to build up a. Um, uh, the, the street levels um, around the sides. And this, this is actually a, um, a look into a excavation site and you see that it was a pure building material, just the upper layer had to be removed, but uh, below the, the first meter you had plenty of building materials. And this is almost finished as a pre-excavated um, site. And as I said, um, um, a good part, about 50% of these materials were, and even the upper layer, the upper first meter was used for um, the um, uh, landscape design and for the um, urban, um, um, uh, urbanistic scheme. And, um, and our in situ um, mobile concrete unit was surely the first in Austria uh, there was a double unit uh, which uh, exceeded the maximum efficiency of 200 cube meter per hour. So finally, um, not only not only one single um, um, uh, concrete mixer had to come from downtown or from another side, and all um, the material needed, the concrete needed, was produced on site. Yeah. And even with a vet preparation, because uh, um, normally you can use the excavation materials for 50% of, um, of all concrete needed in, in construction, at least in housing. Um, but um, when, you, when you can wash the gravel and you know, can wash the excavation material um, and uh, sieve and crush it and then wash it, you can uh, do 100% of all um, concrete needed on site. So this was um, the processing of the, of the washing. And, um, and finally, um, when we did this tendering, um, we could not really get much support from the industry here, from the building industry. And uh, that might have been um, linked to the fact that at this very same year in 2013 and 14, um, there had been this, um, this court um, uh, suing the German um, cement industry and uh, finally um, 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 suing them to pay uh, almost 300 million um, euros uh, for, um, uh, uh, how do you say, for um, um, <laughs> talking too much to, to each other. <laughs> So, and this is the situation of, um, of raw material in Austria. And you can say this is per perfectly um, working with the 
urban areas. Uh, so you have the Wiener Becken, and and uh, they have uh, have the, uh, even in Innsbruck you have uh, uh, the best uh, material for building purposes and uh, Wiener um, Wiener Neustadt, and um, and this is the Pannonian um, uh, resources. And, and even Graz uh, does not look bad. Only the upper um, Alps are uh, not really uh, usable for building purposes. So um, our next um, um, theme will be um, the preparation of recycling material. And um, it's very, very important to realize that um, the on-site recycling is not just uh, more ecologic, because um, uh, when you do the sieving and the crushing of, um, of um, demolition waste material on site, you have to use for, for 300, uh, for 3000 tons, you have to use 6,000 liters of diesel. And when you um, transport the same amount of uh, material uh, to a stationary facility and you bring it back to the site, you use 55,000 liters of diesel. So you can save 90% of all diesel emissions just by using it on site. And of course, it's much cheaper yeah, because the transportation does cost um, something. And you can spare 130 tons uh, in that case. And you can spare also 130,000 uh, uh, euros. And that means you, you, you pay uh, um, per ton CO2 uh, on transport at 1,000 euro for nothing yeah, when you do not use the material on site. And here, the first comes the crusher and then the sieving facility. And of course, you have some handling on the side. Yeah. You have to produce different fractions and you have to store them. So there's a lot of handling of, of materials, but we succeeded now, um, and this is um, our our exhibition um, uh, in, in Graz, which uh, is going to be op uh, open um, is, is about to open in the next uh, few days, and um, and this is what we did in in Reininghaus in Graz with for just um, these two high rises. So you don't have to have a whole urban area being developed. You can scale this down to the size of bigger buildings also. And actually, but actually it's the same procedure um, as we've been talking about now. Um, so you have this mobile um, concrete unit, you have the sieving of the sand and the excavation material, you have the processing of the mineral materials, which actually was a, um, a giant um, brewery cave uh, with, the, um, with the ice keller and, um, and, and to store the beer um, below the, the, uh, the earth in, in deep down cellars. Um, and, um, and we could use and process uh, 50,000 tons of material just to build these two high rises in Graz on site. Yeah. And again, here you see um, the uh, construction site, and uh, this is um, the, uh, the other plot of the developer, uh, which has been used for storing the material. And of course, it's not easy when you don't have uh, enough space and enough time or simply do not have the will. But in this case, it was extremely um, uh, easy to uh, use the, the site just be, be next to our construction site. And these are the cellars that have, a, uh, have an impression um, how deep they were, and how giant, and this is um, 
taken actually from the from the um, from the television. And here you have the materials, and here the finished side ready to be built. And again, um, this material flow I'm I'm talking about can be used actually for any architecture and for any site. And actually, there is no no reason not to do it for all the others as well. Yeah. And now I'm I'm about uh, to come to an end, <laughs> and I will talk about um, a baucarousel, and this was actually also a typical um, uh, as um, a, a typical site in uh, in Vienna, where we had this facility. Um, it was Bayersdorf, and I, and within this facility, I found um, actually the bill for <laughs> for this uh, logistics shelf um, it was um, has been erected in the year uh, let me let me look on it 2002 for um, 4.8 million euros and it was uh, really brand new as a storage as a logistic storage for 10000 um, um, uh, pallets and actually, there is a market for the reuse of this um, logistic infrastructure, but we just couldn't manage uh, to find someone. And finally, uh, the metal worth of uh, uh, the, the, the revenues of uh, the recycling of this metal uh, was 12,000 euro. So this was a, a stroke in our face. And that was actually the moment when we decided to um, to found Baucarousel to have a player uh, which could, um, or at least with, who uh, could make it possible to reuse a, such a good working um, infrastructure, which should not be destroyed or diminished um, to its pure material value, and to save the intelligence of uh, of products and building uh, structures. And this is how uh, we founded a Baucarousel. And uh, actually, we uh, did invent the word, uh, the word for it uh, because we're doing urban mining since quite a while. But in that case, it was not so much about the material, but more about the people working uh, with the materials. And, um, and we used uh, social enterprises um, to, to integrate in the um, dismantling process. And so it's called social urban mining and actually we started at the same time at the same site you've seen already at the coca-cola um, facility which was a giant logistic um, facility in the, in the south of vienna and we started just um, with the insulation panels on the on the roof yeah, there were about twelve thousand square meters of um, uh, insulation panels which could be used in the later process as a perimeter insulation for the garages in, in the earth. So there was no, no problem with that uh, to, to be reused. So this was our first job with a uh, Baukhausen. And finally, we would get them from the roof and we stored them and we reused them on site. And um, so slowly since then, since uh, 2016, actually founded in 2015, we are working uh, with the following scheme. So social urban mining is trying to, to use the, um, or the added value of, by sorting and um, collecting um, valuable material on site, mostly copper and aluminum. And for the venues of these materials, we are just um, paying social enterprises to do some uh, preparation uh, work in the dismantling process, which has to be done anyway. So we are collecting the copper and we are, um, for example, removing the suspended ceiling, which you can see here on the right hand side. Um, so in that case of Coca-Cola, we were trying to, or we were um, asking for um, um, uh, the, um, the preparational work um, was to, um, to get this greenery roof um, down and to um, uh, put it in the big bags and, uh, and trying to resell this. And uh, actually, it um, uh, does not work perfectly, I have to admit. 
and but it, it was our first experience on the on, on the bigger side and what does work uh, is uh, is quite obvious uh, because there is a lot of um, the older the, um, the the building is the more precious are the materials uh, which are used in and for example this is uh, a project we did for the um, uh, Bundesimmobiliengesellschaft in the Mayangasse which is uh, the uh, medical university of vienna and we dismantled the building by collecting these tiles and reselling them um, and all this done with a social enterprises so baukarussell is the first uh, social urban mining um, society if you want to and we are we um, see us as a role model um, for European um, resource standards. And we are trying to build up also a reuse um, market, um, not just in order to, to save resources, but also to create more jobs and more employment in this sector, which is uh, in the pandemic or after the pandemic of enormous importance. And anyway, it's the law. Since uh, 2014, it was implemented in 2016, the 1st January, the uh, Recycling Baustoffverordnung was uh, set in place. And uh, this is referring to the dismantling of building as a standard method for, dem for demolition. So it has to be done anyway. And, um, and we have, obviously we have some problems. Yeah? We have uh, problems with mineral wool, we have problems with asbestos in, in our buildings, and we have problems here, as you can see, uh, this the asbestos treatment, which is necessary within buildings. And here you have the mineral wall treatment, which is necessary in buildings. And this is um, an artistic installation with the, um, with the um, uh, extruded um, uh, insulation panel from polystyrene, which is also um, uh, an important uh, problem in the um, in the um, concerning the costs of a demolition project, yeah, because uh, this material in our days is costing three thousand euros per ton, which is tenfold more than it costs when you buy it as a new product. So, um, getting rid of this kind of building material is more expensive than to buy them. Yeah, and this has to change. We have a lot of brownfields to come, and we have find new methods um, to um, uh, for treating these uh, brownfields. And one of these methods I will finally uh, mention is phyto mining. And uh, actually, phyto mining first come into our minds when we had this um, this competition of uh, the Copacabana, which is a contamination well known in Vienna. And uh, first, uh, when Bernd Fly, um, an architectural practice in Vienna, came to us and asked us, "What would, can we do with this contamination?" And I said, uh, "Well, uh, nothing." actually, because um, you have to, you, you want to remove this from the place. And, um, and actually, um, uh, the only thing we can do is to, to set it on a, on a, on a boat and um, to plant some plants on it. And within a decade or so, uh, with phyto mining, we can extract the, the, um, the potential contamination. And um, uh, and finally, this was what we suggested, and, uh, but we didn't win the competition, so we don't have this uh, this island flo floating around on the Danube. But anyway, that was our first contact with phyto um, remediation, and, and therefore we suggested to the Austrian real estate development to have a closer look on it in the case of uh, Eurogate too, and uh, this was. Um, uh, the, planning, uh, the urbanistic scheme, and this is um, the contamination of the earth um, uh, in our BIM model, and the redder, the, uh, the, the worse. So um, within our findings, we, we did some, you already know, we have this 20 by 20 uh, grid, and then we do some, some slabs here, some slab model of the contaminated ground. And we're trying to figure out where it would be best to place um, the garages, not to paying too hard for, for getting rid of the contamination, but also to have an idea 
what could be used and reused and recycled and in the building materials. And finally, we came up with some recommendations for the developer and uh, including all the mass uh, motions and uh, remiss uh, disposals, which were necessary to build up the park here in the center. And, um, and finally, as I said, we suggested to, to pick out some hotspots of contaminated ground um, to implement fetal re remediation. And this was the one, two, three, four plots we suggested, uh, which could be used for fetal remediation. And actually, you just set in some plants and you're trying to, to extract um, neither is it chrome or is it lead or antimon, uh, for example. And uh, the only thing is you have to have uh, a couple of um, uh, years, um, at least two years, uh, better five years, to make the plants work. And um, actually, there were no time left in that case. And we couldn't implement our first fetal remediation project, but there will soon come others, I'm convinced. So um, I'm about to finish now, almost finished, almost done. And um, uh, we, have, um, we have met already on the side here. And, um, and this was the 3D model of the site. And we um, uh, suggested, um, I mean, uh, several of these buildings, the Rela Halle and Casa Halle are already gone, but the others are still left and ready for reuse. And the, uh, the, uh, the three which uh, are gone already could at least be used as a material on a material base, as you have seen on the side. But it's always uh, more interesting to use um, the building itself and at least uh, the components of, of these buildings which are interesting. Uh, all these three um, buildings left are quite interesting from their structure. And it's uh, what is necessary is another few on the building. Um, uh, for example, on this roof, you remember we have seen, which is actually um, quite well to be um, uh, put in elements and uh, to put it down. And I'd like to finish uh, with another project I, I hopefully will bring into your studio. It's not yet fixed, but uh, nevertheless, I, I dare to show it to you. And um, you keep quiet as long as you can um, till it works. Uh, it's the Ferry Dusika Stadion while we are preparing the demolition work. Um, and it's a beautiful one, actually. And um, it's existing in, um, in several sizes. And, and this one is the biggest one um, all over Vienna. We have about uh, 20 to 20, 10 to 20 uh, uh, different sizes. Um, but it is the biggest one. It's a well-known um, uh, sport event um, hall. And uh, this is our BIM model, and we've been calculating all the masses um, for the reuse or the recycling, actually, and on, on site. And we are um, uh, about to, uh, to suggest um, the, um, the dismantling uh, to be done by Baukarussell also. And, and then finally, we're going to remove the, the, the core first. And, and then only um, the preparation for, for the building's shell. And after the shell, there comes the real construction. And first of all, the roof, which is a suspended uh, construction, really interesting one, reminding to, to bicycle. Um, and, and this is actually the, the real construction, will, which will be the last phase of demolition work. And you see um, uh, one, um, or about 20% of, of this building is invisible and is uh, in the fundum and, and foundation and stuck in the earth. And um, as a final image, <laughs> this is what we hopefully uh, will can give to you um, as a building material for um, recomposing um, another kind of building with the existing building components. And uh, this is um, how I like to end here. And I'm ready for your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for a very inspiring lecture. And indeed, many things we have discussed as a potential concept, you just showed as a realized, as a real life project. <laughs> uh, so it's very inspiring indeed. And um, probably to, I will ask with some kind of you know, questions or 
to clarify something what we heard today. Um, probably to start, like what what do you think is like the biggest problem in reuse? Is it uh, economical or let's say technological problem that it's uh, just easier to tear down the building than accurately disassemble it by pieces? Or is it mental, like we not used to think this way? Or is it aesthetical probably? Like we just don't have this vision how it look could look like the reused building. How would you define the biggest problem? As you said, there are a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with the mindset, yeah? we, we have to uh, open our minds for another mindset in, in treating these kind of intelligent uh, materials. Uh, this is the first step and, and, and you and me, we are doing this step. This is the first and the most important one, I would say. But then we have also to realize that, of course, the dismantling, the careful dismantling of a building is really an investment in time and in money, and it has to pay in, in somehow uh, and, and, and in some calculation. And this is not easy to find. And this is our experience over the last uh, five years when we have to uh, have tried to 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 um, to really reuse um, um, load bearing components, and this is really another dimension. So at the moment, reuse is only uh, referring to to the easy to low hanging fruit, but we have to take the next step, and uh, therefore we have to build up a kind of a marketplace, which is an ongoing process. The city of Vienna, as I said, has um, has issued a challenge for a platform for a digital platform for reuse, and finally they choose all the four uh, offers. Yeah, they choose to um, to support and to supply these four different platforms of reuse um, material, building materials. So this is um, an on, uh, ongoing process, and uh, it's uh, it's taken step by step, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, sounds actually promising. And yeah. um, if like us architects would be would love to be included in this process and help somehow as much as we can. Um, which materials, for example, would you recommend us to use in our projects for the new construction for renovation? What is the easiest to reuse? Uh, is it like such a material which we have to stick to, which we have to focus on? This is a really intelligent question. And I would answer the best um, uh, approach would be um, to, to build up more um, systematic approaches like uh, building systems which could be easily re be recognized as um, as um, uh, I had this lecture today in Munich about prefabricated uh, building systems and this is an intelligent approach also yeah when you use uh, prefabricated or industrialized building components this is much easier to recognize or to be reused and we have this example of uh, Lucas Lang technologies um, and they are rebuying or leasing the building components, they are not just selling it to the developer or the, uh, the uh, contractor, they are leasing it because they are um, offering uh, to, to, um, uh, to take it back. And this is, uh, this is an interesting approach which we should support as architects. Mm -hmm. And if you, I would continue this question, but um, the other way around, what architects should not do? Uh, what is like the most terrible what architect can propose uh, to, to the client for the construction? What's afterwards absolutely impossible to reuse or very hard to reuse? Well, we should all open up our minds. Recently, I've been invited to, to a big architectural practice in Vienna, and I told them that um, the deposit of Gibbs will soon be forbidden, that the mineral wall in all dry works is contaminated and treated like asbestos, and, and there is no, use, there's no more um, reason left to, to consider dry work, the usual dry work, as reasonable. Yeah? And all they said was, okay, um, um, but uh, all, all the other um, alternatives are too expensive right now, and we are um, uh, we stick to flexibility in our floor plans and so on. And this is not <laughs> this is uh, simply ignoring the facts that we are playing with our future by ignoring um, the basics of uh, of the close future and, and um, the deposition of gypsum will soon be extremely extraordinary expensive 
and and uh, so dry work is is no no option anymore for example yeah you have to you have really to raise this awareness of of mistakes yeah already been been made I, I mean, um, when I did my um, diploma work uh, decades ago, I did some research on mineral wool, but I could not find any study about being being uh, uh, HP uh, uh, seven criteria of the uh, WHO, and, and and now it's it's clear that um, mineral wool is has to be treated like asbestos. Mm -hmm. And if you would have to list, let's say, three, five, the worst materials are the most difficult. So I understand that the toxic probably uh, part is one of, one of the most crucial, uh, which makes them difficult to reuse. Probably other parameters of examples of materials just to provide better understanding to us. Yes, as we are also a consultant for Ecobuy Vienna, and we are really, really, we are working on this problem because um, you, you cannot count on recycling when you accumulate all these uh, toxic materials. Yeah. Uh, so, Nikos, I think you have to turn off your microphone. Uh, to give to your dog. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, so the accumulation of, of toxic material is, is a major problem. And um, when you look at circular construction, um, experts like Michael Braungart, which is the, the Pope of cradle to cradle in Germany, and he's clearly saying we have to avoid any toxic in any building material to make it recyclable or reusable. And this is another approach. This is really, really a hard thing to do because we have so little products without any toxic substance. This is, I mean, you look at the cradle to cradle um, uh, label and you see this, this is um, uh, half a dozen or no, it's, it's, it's a little more, but it's not uh, a hundred uh, products have been certified by this label. Yeah, it's kind of clear. It's, it's getting better. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully. And I mean, I believe it will get better and better. Uh, and um, yeah, and uh, as soon as we'll, uh, we'll raise the awareness of it a bit higher, uh, these restrictions and um, uh, regulations for the materials will show up and uh, get implemented uh, with much, much higher speed than it is now. Uh, I will probably go to the questions of students now. They're in the uh, chat. Some of them we partially has already discussed. So, and the first question from Victoria uh, Nemeth is, are there any special permission you have to acquire uh, to use construction materials from site recycled materials, uh, site recycled materials? Yes, there are a lot. There are, there are a lot of standards to be fulfilled and we have to, to respect them in our, um, in our, uh, uh, in the um, in the procurement phase, also within the in the in the construction phase itself, and it has to be uh, surveyed, and it has to be so. It's it's another approach. It's it's really not easy, but it's um, they have to be respected and uh, to be certified as cert as building materials. Yes. Um, and there are a lot of special uh, permissions also for on-site recycling facilities. So this is not an easy job, but it's feasible. Thank you. And uh, she continues with the other question. Do you examine the site prior to starting the design uh, process in order to use as much from the site and all buildings in, in the new design? Exactly. This is exactly what we are doing here, mainly in the office. <laughs> no, we are, we are, in, in a way, we are exceeding the, the perspective of the architect. Yeah? And we are really, now we are kind of experts also in building materials or in earth uh, contamination degrees, yeah? which, is quite, uh, which is kind of exceeding our, our, our horizon as, an, as a planner. Yeah? And this is necessary. Um, to, to make this kind of concepts. And of course, we have a lot of consultants working with us. Mm, thanks. And um, then question from Georgie. He asks uh, three questions. So the first one, question according uh, to, recyc to recycling on the site. Would you describe the recycling of used materials on the site more as an, 
as as in building logistic challenge than an architectural challenge. Absolutely. So is it so yes. is it it's more logistics uh, rather Absolutely. than architectural problem? Yeah. We're also trying to uh, as for, for different sides. We had a logistic support from professional building logistics uh, um, like Zeppelin or like Renos, who did the job in the Potsdamer Platz um, uh, 20 years ago almost. So a professional logistic is, is, is crucial for these kind of approaches. I mean, on a bigger scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question, and by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. Uh, let's see how is the other one. Uh, so the second question from Georgia, uh, question according to uh, Seestadt. So uh, Seestadt, uh, was the whole or the most part of the building materials produced with the soil which was signed out or was the material only used for leveling uh, the site and leveling up the infrastructure? No, as I said, the upper layer could not be used for building purposes. So you had you have to mix this uh, kind of upper layer, which is uh, fine sand and sand, with the uh, with the lower layer gravel to use it and for um, building the, um, the the landscape design. But um, most of the um, the gravel is highly uh, precious uh, building material and can be easily be processed uh, on site. Mm -hmm. um, and the third question we somehow I think uh, spoke about it so the third question is uh, how do you approach uh, the non-structural materials uh, the recycling of non-structural materials they're using is it sometimes possible to keep it uh, other keep keep it other it recycling possibilities of these materials are there any recycled possibilities of these materials yeah, I hope that to make that clear, because building purpose is just one side and the other side is um, um, substrates, vegetation substrates for the building roof, for the, um, for, for the landscape design. And this is really a crucial finding of our la late uh, 10 years of work, because of, uh, when I started, I was just thinking and fixed on building materials. But then on the other hand, a lot of materials you have to use after standards is also applied for um, the greenery of building. And this is, um, I think, a crucial finding in terms of uh, um, um, climate change adaption. Uh, we have to use more green uh, buildings and we have to, to have uh, uh, vegetation on the roof um, to provide um, uh, um, um, uh, protection against uh, precipitation and heavy rainfall in summer and all this kind of stuff. So this is a total another material approach when you consider uh, to use also a vegetation substrate. Because the upper layer is the first thing you have in hand when you start to build, and it's the last thing you apply to building. Yeah, yeah um, thanks, very uh, interesting. And um, the then question from Pamela, uh, how do you determine the usability of uh, material? How do you ensure that the uh, salvaged material con conforms uh, to the norm to the norm requirements. Yes, just by the waste um, audit, uh, we uh, you have to have anyway before, but there you have clearly to describe that uh, the guy um, with the laboratory has to examine the quality of concrete or has to examine this or that, um, and 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 as soon as long as you have this in your hand, you can you can manage it and uh, you can determine the reusability by your own and by let by let it um, examine but um, in the end um, it all depends on your capacity of, uh, of uh, lowering the costs so in most cases the reusability um, has to go along with uh, minor costs uh, for the investor and and this is what you have also have in mind so when we do um, um, uh, the tendering, for example, we also of, uh, ask for minor costs so when so this or that is already been taken away. So um, you have um, uh, to have different options um, uh, when it comes to the question of costs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, the other question uh, would be how much of, uh, of the dismantled materials 
ends up uh, being reused on this side on the same site if you have any estimate percentage well finally i have to admit that most sites do not have a real dance program and and um, and uh, it was not the case like in in aspen where only a third has been built and the rest was um, was available for for um, implementing um, the logistics uh, which we needed so um, it's not the normal case it's not the standard case of course not but in most cases in in urban development areas in at the fringe or at the um, outer skirt of the of the town it's feasible yeah you won't do this in the first district of vienna but you can easily apply it for housing schemes like a Beresgasse, like a, like a nordbahnhof or a nordwestbahnhof like all these huge areas where you have brown fields and and um, and a lot of space um, before it uh, comes comes to an end. I mean, it's the last phase is always uh, the hardest. But uh, uh, when you're starting such a huge development project like Nordwestbahnhof, you have uh, enough space and enough uh, time to to have a concept like this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's kind of touching question. Next question from Klaus. Is there any experience uh, with on-site recycling at construction sites where there is not uh, as much space available uh, for the storage uh, and processing, uh, for example, in the city areas? Yes, uh, within the Wildgarten, for the first time, we could, uh, we could prove that it's worth to hire or to rent another surface to just um, uh, have another um, uh, logistic option. And I hope that this will uh, sooner or later become um, a new scheme for building in Vienna because it's, it's uh, much less expensive than uh, the deposition on a landfill and the transportation. Yeah, sounds very smart and you know, probably also very much better for the ecology. Absolutely. And then uh, Mario asks, are there any noise issues in recycling materials on site? I would assume that uh, it could be uh, more bothering uh, for neighbors if the uh, machines are too loud and the process would take a very long time. Um, yeah, what is it? <laughs> it's a good question and that's really hard to, to manage. And, um, and from time to time, we are using the existing buildings to have a shelter, a noise and a dust shelter. And we are just taking off the roof of these existing buildings and we have a noise shelter and a dust shelter to proceed this uh, with these materials so there are a lot of options and a lot of ideas coming up but this is a crucial uh, issue of course and you are totally right so you're, you're reusing first the building uh, for as a reuse as a station station for, to reuse the materials and then <laughs> so it's like Correct. several cycles of the reuse uh, yeah. reusing the reuse which I think is also very important to all of us thinking uh, how we can uh, reuse in many different levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other question from uh, Lena, uh, do you see the growth of the reusing materials over the years or is it, uh, or is it stagnant? Um, as I said in the lecture before, we had more um, the statistic approach for, for the last hundred years and it's in fact um, a, a bit of fact that we uh, that recycling and uh, the circularity um, rate is then is steadily uh, stagnating or decreasing. It's uh, there's uh, not much progr progress on it. And one thing and one reason is because it's not made on site because it's 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 much ex is more expensive than the primary resource when you have to transfer all this demolition waste to a stationary um, uh, a facility and to process these materials there and to retransport it as I've showed it in um, on, on this uh, in this uh, case study. So there is no um, uh, economic reason for recycling in a way. But uh, as soon as long as you don't do it um, as part of a, of a strategy on site, and this is one of the major reasons why it's uh, it's not clear that this should be done. So that's one of somehow uh, just to highlight 
the the basis for for recycling to be economically reasonable is to organize as much as possible on site um, and that should be clear to everyone and probably out of this we have to uh, build up any architectural concept or any that would should be departure point for our thinking uh, of the recycle. It doesn't come from another country, another part of the world, the recycled material. It comes as a source of the site. So uh, that's very, the mining of the site, that's a key um, point. Precisely. Uh, okay, and then, uh, so um, there, was, there was another question, I think, yeah, from Gabi. Are there uh, any interesting and important websites or books for further research that you could recommend to us all? I guess I've done this already. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any advantage when you buy a, a recycling atlas, but, um, and you can even um, uh, download our, um, our English uh, contribution on, on my website. But this is really, an, in our days, one of the crucial um, and most important um, um, uh, books and uh, literature on, on, uh, on the secondary uh, material use and the uh, urban uh, mining approach in, uh, in design also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So at this point, uh, I would like probably to uh, finalize our presentation, your lecture. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the presentation. Now somehow um, many things got much more clear, at least in my head. I hope <laughs> at the students as well. Uh, it was very good overview of uh, general uh, products of recycling and particularly your uh, work. And uh, it was also very inspiring to see that many of the things they really they could happen. It's not just some abstract things, but they can happen right here in front of us. And we just have to be more aware of these possibilities and get more involved in this process in all the possible levels. And uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. It was very inspiring and uh, very informative. Thank, thank you for you. the invitation. Thank you all the students for attending and, um, and goodbye. And I get back to you because of the execution. <laughs> Thank you. Ciao. Goodbye, Bye. everyone.